In class, I mentioned to you uh, a function called the Dirichlet function, which I referred to as a monster. And this is the monster. Um, it looks like a hot mess, but if we kind of look at it piece by piece, it's actually doing something very interesting. And I call it a monster not because this looks so ugly, but because of the interesting properties that this graph has after we actually understand what it's doing. So let's forget this thing and let's look at something simpler and build our way up. Let's just start with the part in the middle. Uh, let's consider f of x equals cosine pi x. This is just a scaled cosine function where it achieves its maximum on every even integer, which means it achieves its minimums on the odd integers. All right, let's square this function. What's going to happen then? When we square this, all of the negative values, when you multiply them by themselves, will reflect up here to become positive. Um, the values will also change a little bit, which will change the overall shape. It will have the effect of kind of flattening these parts out. But as a kind of conceptual sketch, it's going to look more or less like this. Except we have to pretend that this is perfectly regular and symmetric. All right, let's get one of those limits in there. What happens if we take the limit of the last function as n approaches infinity, and we've put n as an exponent? What this is saying is that we're going to choose an x value. We'll calculate what is cosine of pi times that x value. And then we'll square it. And then we'll look at what happens as we take that number and we raise it to higher and higher and higher powers. And whatever the result of that process is, wherever it looks like those y values are heading, that's going to be the value of our function for that x. So for example, if I choose x equals 1, cosine of pi is going to be 1. I'll square it, still 1. And so it doesn't matter as n approaches infinity. I'll just have 1 times itself. So that will be 1. I hope you can see that the same thing will be true for any of these other integer values. Because whenever x was an integer, that was exactly when this inner part was equal to 1. And as I said before, you can raise 1 to itself as many times as you'd like, and it will never change value. All right, well, what's happening at all of the other x values here? Even if I move over just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit uh, in my original g graph, I'll have a value that is slightly less than 1. Well, if I have an x value so that this cosine squared is slightly less than 1, if I'm going to raise a value that's slightly less than 1 to higher and higher and higher powers, they're going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so eventually, the limit is going to approach 0. What that means is that at every single other point, we have the output of this function as being 0. So already, this is, this is kind of a strange and interesting function. We've got a function that takes on a 0 value everywhere except at integer values where it takes on the value 1. So we've just got all these little isolated points here. All right, let's now add in the second limit. So what have I done here? What I've done is I've added a number k that's approaching infinity. And I've put that right in the middle on the inside of the cosine function as a multiple of the pi x. So what's that going to do? If you're guessing that it's going to affect which x values will let cosine take on the value 1, then that would be correct. So let's think about a couple of examples here. Um, let's look at the old examples first. So if I have a positive integer value, um, I'll have a multiple of pi. And as k gets larger and larger, k factorial is going to get larger and larger. Um, but I'll still just have multiples of pi. And as you know, every multiple of pi for cosine is going to give me a positive or a negative 1. And then when I square that, it'll be positive 1. So in other words, uh, we ha adding this k factorial hasn't changed our answer for the positive or the negative integers. All right, well, what about things that aren't integers? Let's look at maybe when x equals 1 half. When x equals 1 half, the cosine on the inside gives us k factorial times 1 half pi. Well, if k is something like 1, then cosine pi over 2 isn't going to give us a positive or a negative 1 anymore. 
But we're not interested in small k. We're going to look at what happens as k approaches infinity. So as k gets larger, we don't have to go very far as soon as k equals 2 factorial. Now the k factorial is going to cancel with the denominator down here. And again, we'll have a positive integer multiple of pi. So what that means is that when x equals 1 half, because the k factorial canceled the denominator, we're still going to get out of this a positive 1. All right, well, let's look at a, a weirder example. Um, what happens if we have, I don't know, some very strange uh, rational number, like 1,023 divided by 7, 7, 7, 7, 7. All right, well, that's a real ugly. So what's going to happen to this part as k approaches infinity? As k gets larger and larger and larger, eventually k factorial is going to cancel out this 7777. Well, hold on. How do I know that it's going to cancel out the 7777 exactly? The reason why is because I can rewrite the denominator here as its prime decomposition. The prime factorization of 7777 is 7 times 1111. And as we can see, as k factorial, uh, sorry, as k approaches infinity, eventually k is going to be large enough that both 7 and 1111 occur in the expansion of k factorial. So that's how I know that as k approaches infinity, it doesn't matter what the, de what the denominator is. Eventually, k factorial is going to cancel it out, and then we're going to have a positive integer multiple of pi, which means that we'll get a 1 out. So pay attention to what I just said here. I said it doesn't matter what the denominator is. So x could be any rational number at all, where a rational number is written a over b, with a and b both integers. So for any rational number at all, this k factorial is going to eventually make it so that the output is 1. All right, well, does that just mean that my function now is always 1 everywhere? Let's think about a number that is not a rational number and see what happens then. What happens if we have x equals square root of 2? We'll have cosine k factorial of root 2 pi. Well, all right. I know that this cosine will take on the value 1 if the inside here is ever a positive integer multiple of pi. Is that ever true? Can I find some value for k uh, and if I multiply that by the square root of 2, uh, it's going to somehow turn that into a positive integer. Is that possible? Let's assume for a second that k factorial times the square root of 2 can eventually give you a positive integer. That's like saying this, k factorial times root 2 eventually gives you a positive integer, um, which I'll call p, and I'll write in the form p divided by 1, which is a rational number. All right. Um, if that's true, then I can divide both sides by k factorial, and I have root 2 equals p divided by k factorial. k factorial is an integer, and p is also, it's a very large integer, but it's still an integer. p is an integer, so that suggests that the square root of 2 can be written in the form of an integer divided by an integer, which would make it a rational number, which we know isn't true. Um, because the conclusion isn't true, that must mean our original assumption written right here is also false. So that's shown us that it doesn't really matter what k factorial is. No value for k would ever let us multiply it by the square root of 2 and end up with an integer. So if the inside here is never an integer multiple of pi, that must mean that when we take the cosine of it, it's going to be a value that is, well, and then we square it, it will be a value that's smaller than 1. And remember, as we take the limit of higher and higher powers of something that is smaller than 1, this is eventually going to approach 0. So what do we have? We have a function, so that I'm going to define the same function in another way. We have a function that equals 1 when x is a rational number, and we have a function that's 0 when x is an irrational number. Every real number is either rational or irrational. So that means that this function's domain is all real numbers. It's defined everywhere. What does it look like if we graph it? Well, you might know that between any two rational numbers, there's an irrational number. And between any two irrational numbers, there is a 
rational number. So it seems like what's going to happen is at rational numbers, we're going to have one. So at all the integer values and at all the fractional values. So I'm going to have sort of a, a very dense scatter of points up here. Whoops, this is a straight line. But then all the irrational values, like the square root of 2 and like pi and like e and like the sort of other square roots, I'm going to have a scatter of points at 0. Um, this is just an approximation. We can't ever actually really graph this function because um, in this empty space, this seemingly empty space, there's actually an infinite number of rational numbers in there. So we would have to put an infinite number of points in there. And same thing with the space in here. Between these two irrational numbers, what looks like empty space is actually full of an infinite number of irrational values there. Think back to what we said today in class about continuity. We said that a function is continuous at a point. What we said today was that a function is continuous at a point a if the limit as x approaches a is equal to the value of the function at that point. Well, here we have just a whole bunch of isolated points. So we can't possibly even begin to start taking the limit. So what that means is that this function is defined everywhere, but it is continuous nowhere. There is no point at which it is continuous. And that's why I called it a monster.